Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to uh, share this beef cooking experience with you as part of our Top Cut Beef Contest that we run annually through New York or with partnership with New York Beef Council. Um, this year, we're focused on the cafeteria takeover. And before we get started, my name is Jeremiah Best. I'm the educator for New York Agriculture in the Classroom. We want to share uh, just a couple of dates coming up. So if you go to our website, to our Top Cut page, you will see that we have uh, the roadmap. We have opened the contest. We do have a rolling registration, so please feel free to join us at any time. As you get into October 17th, um, today we have the virtual cooking experience. We will be closing the competition on December 2nd and hopefully announcing our winners um, December, by December 22nd. So with that being said, I want to introduce Chrissy Claudio, who is the Director of Producer Communication and Consumer Engagement, who will, and will share with us their guests from New York Beef Council or from the Beef Council. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to join us today. Again, I just wanted to let me pull up my slide. Make sure it's working. There you go. Uh, I just wanted to take the time again to thank New York Ag in the Classroom for partnering with us again this year for um, our Top Cut competition. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter today, um, Dr. Chef Alex Reese from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Thank you very much for being our presenter today um, and for this virtual experience. Uh, Alex oversees all NCBA food production as well as Beef Culinary Center operations, testing and demos. He has spent the last several years as a chef and has held nearly every position in a kitchen that's possible. Uh, this makes him a very knowledgeable in very in different styles of cooking, which he applies to beef. Uh, Chef Alex graduated from Johnson and Wales University in Denver with a degree in culinary arts. Chef Alex also comes from a small cattle community in upstate New York, where members of his family raise cattle. In his free time, you can find Alex and his wife exploring the local food scene for new and exciting trends, as well as working on project cars. So, just a few housekeeping uh, details. Please make sure that your um, microphones are muted. Questions are welcome and we can facilitate that at the end and throughout the presentation. And also we will be recording today's webinar so we can share it with everybody afterwards. So without further ado, I will let Chef Alex take over. Oh, sorry, Chef Alex, you're muted. So as Chef Alex is getting his uh, volume taken care of, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in our Q&A section, and we'll make sure to relay those questions to Chef, Chef Alex as he demos. And Chef Alex, can you guys hear me great now? to have it. Yes, we, yes, we can. Great. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We are live from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, funded by the Beef Checkoff here in Denver. Um, it's still pretty early in the morning uh, over here, but we're going to make some tasty burgers uh, just in time for you guys uh, during lunch today. Uh, the recipe we have today for you, uh, we just developed this summer uh, with a uh, partnership with uh, King's Hawaiian and Gorilla's Pickles. Um, it's just something that we do here in the Culinary Center. We do partnerships. Uh, we can put recipes on these partners' websites, um, and we can make recipes for them so that we can put them out to consumers. Driving beef sales, of course, um, is always fantastic. Uh, so we developed this recipe this summer, uh, like I said, with that partnership. Um, it was a great challenge uh, to overcome. Uh, we took a look at both their, res what, uh, both their uh, websites um, for recipes that they already had, and it was uh, looking through thousands of recipes to try to figure out what worked best for both companies. Um, so that's what we developed here. Um, it's a great recipe. Uh, we tested it right here in the Culinary Center, um, both on gas and electric. Uh, that's what we do in here. And then uh, it went through a triple test process and uh, the final results, results for it are fantastic. Um, the partnership was successful um, and it really drove up beef sales along with pickles and uh, these slider buns this summer. Uh, so let's get started. I'm gonna be working off my plancha grill here today. You guys can be working um, an outside grill or something like that. Um, plancha is great. You can also use a skillet uh, to cook on as well. Both fantastic. Um, 
I already got this preheated and ready to go. And what we're actually going to do first is we're going to start on the sauce for the recipe. It is a beer cheese sauce. Um, when we tested this recipe, we realized that, you know, consumers, um, for whatever reason, might not um, want beer in this cheese sauce. So uh, we tested this recipe with uh, beef stock, and that's what I'm going to be doing today with you guys. Um, works just the same. You don't get the beer flavor so much through it, but um, the recipe still works just as well, um, and it comes out fantastic. Uh, so I got some cream cheese here. I just got one block. I'm just going to add that right over here to my saucepan. I'm going to add a third of a cup of heavy cream in there. I got a cup of just shredded cheddar cheese. And then that beef stock. It's going to pour all of that in my pot. I got it on medium. I actually got it on low heat. I'm going to turn this up to about medium. Uh, we don't want it to be too high because we don't want that cheese um, and dairy to stick to the bottom there. Um, you're just going to kind of mix it up. And we're going to want to start to get this cooking. We're going to want that cream cheese to kind of melt down um, and mix in there with everything. So this is kind of great uh, to start with. Um, it's great to start with. Like I said, we can build our burgers while this just kind of cooks off to the side here. Um, I'm just going to leave it on the medium heat. I'll come back to it and watch it. Um, but it just needed to melt and do its kind of thing right now. Uh, so we're going to come back over here. We're going to build our burgers now. So I got a, a pound of lean ground beef here. Uh, you can use whatever you'd like. Today, we're going to be using 90-10. Fantastic. I love it. Um, it doesn't have all that extra fat um, that would clog up this little plancha over here. So the leaner, the better in this case. Uh, so I got my pound of ground beef. And I'm going to get this put into this bowl over here. We're going to mix this up. I also have some breadcrumbs that will be going in here as well. These are unseasoned breadcrumbs. I find that it's easier that you can just kind of control that seasoning a little bit by using the unseasoned. And a fourth a cup of the breadcrumbs, a little bit of granulated garlic, black pepper, and a fourth of a teaspoon of salt. We don't want a lot of salt in this recipe. Um, going through the testing process, we knew we were gonna be using um, these King Hawaiian pretzel bun sliders. They already have that salt on the top, as you can see um, right there. We didn't wanna add extra salt to it. The cheese sauce also has salt in it. Um, so we wanted to keep the salt as little as possible. So that's why there's only a little bit in the ground beef mixture, but we're just gonna mix this up. Now it's important when you um, mix this not to overwork it. You can even uh, let this rest. And that's what I do at home actually is I'll mix up all my seasonings in this ground beef, and then I will stick it back in my fridge and kind of let it rest. That kind of helps it um, just in case I did overmix it at any point. But what overmixing does is it makes it tough, um, and nobody wants a tough, dense burger. We want it to be light and juicy. Um, so just beware of not to overmix it. I can see that all that breadcrumb is kind of mixed in there. I can see that the seasonings are mixed throughout, and that's probably good to go, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to form this into sliders. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of our mixture here. We're going to ball it up. And now a great tip for this um, is to make sure that we form patties that are just slightly larger than my slider buns because they will shrink as we cook. Uh, we don't want to make them too small. And then they just uh, there's too much bun, right? Um, you can do this with normal burgers, um, but we're just going to make sure that we just want to make them slightly bigger than our buns. So I just have a little ball here, and I'm just going to press this out. Another trick for making burgers, if, if you have like leftover seasoning bottle lids, um, you can use those to form um, the patties as well. And those work great. All right. So Chef Alex, right. I do have yeah, a question for you. What is the difference between a slider and a burger? Yeah, yeah. So a slider is just the really miniature um, version of a burger. Uh, it'll be less meat in there, but it's usually spread out between three or four of these miniature burgers um sliders yeah just really small um fun things to eat uh whether you're at um a restaurant maybe a sports bar or something like that um there's usually a slider on the menu um and they're just fantastic little bites to eat i'm just going to make up four here i have a lot of ground beef left but um i'm just going to make four for today's purposes so 
looking at the grill top, could the classrooms um, use a George Foreman grill? I know a lot of classrooms have been sent yeah, George yeah. Foreman grills in the past. Would that be similar to what you're cooking on? Yep, that totally works just fine as well. Um, if you're using a George Foreman, we want to make sure that we don't push down on top of that burger. We don't want all those juices to come out of it. Um, it's better to leave it open. Um, that way, uh, we're not losing all that, all those juices and all that delicious product. So as you can see here, I got my grills right on there, or my burgers right on my grill there. Um, they're going to start cooking up. That plancha, it's set to about medium, medium high heat. Uh, we don't want it to be too hot because it's, they will burn on there. So we don't want any of that happening. What I'm going to do is now, while those start cooking, is go back to my cheese sauce here. And the cream cheese is getting nice and melted here. It's not quite uh, to where we want it, but we're just going to kind of keep this working. It's already starting to smell great. <laughs> and while yeah, you're mixing that, we have a question from sure. Princeton Academy fifth grade class. And they want to know why does overmixing create a tougher burger? And why do you let it rest if you've overmixed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the overmixing of the meat, it's like a, it's like a muscle. The more you flex the, you know, the tougher the muscle gets. Um, so we just want to let that relax. We don't want to mix it too much. Mixing, it just makes it tough and dense. Um, having it sit there and rest like I do at home is the best way. Cause then it has that chance to re-relax. Um, it doesn't get all that denseness into it. Um, uh, so that's why I always let it rest or you just be careful not to overmix it. If maybe if you've had overmixing before in a burger or maybe a meatloaf, uh, sometimes if you overmix meatloaf the same way, anything with ground beef, really, um, it just makes that dense meatloaf and it's kind of tough um, sensation. So we don't want that. So it's just easy just to kind of keep things light, um, just mix just enough to get things worked in there and um, that'll keep a better product for you. That was a great question. So as you're flipping the burgers, um... Another question is, you mentioned pressing down with the George Farming grill, but does that go for all burgers? Say if I have it on a cooktop or on a grill, you often see yeah. people take that spatula and press it down. But yep. Is that how you want to cook it or is, do you want to avoid it? No, that? that's not how we want to cook it at all. We never want to We never want to push down on our burgers. As you can see right here, I don't want to be pushing down on this even with tongs. Um, and that George Farmer, we don't want to push down. Um, that's just going to re release these juices out. Um, we don't want that. We want our burger to be nice and juicy. Um, so we never want to push down. Um, you can turn. Um, turning the meat uh, is okay um, as long as we're not turning it too much on the grill. Um, moving it like this back and forth is totally fine. Um, but flipping side to side a little too much can also make it tough. So I've often heard the saying, brown to flavor town and i know you're cooking with uh, some hash marks there what what is the importance of getting a good sear on a piece of meat yeah um getting a good sear no matter what it is a burger or a steak um or even like a roast or anything like that um it's just great visually um and then also it develops that nice crust on the outside um all of that crust is just uh seasonings and flavors um that have just seared to the outside of the pan they just absorbed all that juicy um butter or oil or whatever else on the outside and it's created that nice sear um it locks in all that flavor um and you just get a better product that way whatever you're searing um you'll see these burgers here and i'm gonna point down to the camera here and we can see on this other side here um we can already see we got some grill marks going on this side um and that's just all that flavor on there um it's just delicious we're gonna give these a couple more minutes on this side um, and then we'll flip these over. Uh, we'll put our buns on last here. They're not gonna to take too long. Uh, we have our toppings already prepped up as well. Um, when we developed this recipe, um, like I said, we went through a triple testing process. Um, we tested this on uh, gas and electric. Uh, we tested it on this kind of a cooktop as well using the plancha, um, it works great. We made sure that no matter where you are, no matter what you're using, this recipe will turn out the same. And like I said, we did the same thing with the cheese sauce and not adding the beer to it and just substituting that with some beef stock. Um, and that turned out fantastic as well. 
And actually going back to that cheese sauce, I mean, we can shoot the camera over here at this. It's already melted up here. It looks great. Um, you can kind of see that consistency there um, All the nice cheese sauce and it's already great. Um, all that, that cheese is melted down. We're nice and smooth. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna turn this to a low heat now and just kind of keep this warm. Uh, we don't need to cook it anymore. Uh, we don't wanna necessarily turn it off because then it'll congeal a little bit on us. So we're just gonna keep it on low. We're gonna keep stirring it and watching it. But this is ready to go for the burgers. And now going back to the burgers, uh, let's uh, give these a flip. And I had another great, while you're flipping the burgers, another great question from, fifth, from Truxton Academy's fifth grade. They want to know what, what cut of the cow is ground beef from? What cut of the cow is ground beef? Um, well, that depends on the grind that you get. Um, today we're using sirloin. Um, so that's coming from the uh, sirloin area of the cow. So that back part, I'll point over here. Uh, you can see it right over there where it says sirloin on my cow. Um, that's right where that um, is coming from. Uh, it's coming from uh, trim. Uh, that they couldn't use for maybe steaks or something like that. that they have just ground. Um, you might see chuck. Uh, that's pretty common when you're buying ground beef. That's coming from that chuck area of the cow. Um, same process as before. They're just using some trimmings, some scraps. Um, nothing bad, of course. And then they're just grinding that down. Um, so to answer the question, it comes from different parts of the cow, um, depending on what you buy. That was a great question. So if I wanted to develop maybe a richer burger, could I think about using uh, ground meat from a different part of the cow? Yeah, yep. Yeah, if you want to do your own burger blend, I highly recommend that. It's fantastic. Uh, you can always go to a butcher or to a store and ask them to grind down different cuts for you. Uh, people all the time will use brisket in theirs and you use a blend. Um, so you're grinding down that brisket, mixing it with maybe some of that lean sirloin and then some of that richness of the chuck um, in there creates that perfect blend of juiciness, um, flavor, and then a little bit of leanness in there as well. So um, play around. Uh, there's no real um, anything I can recommend to say, you know, do 20% this. Just kind of build what you want um, as far as your flavor goes. So I have a great question from Mrs. Parsons class, and it kind of goes to what you do as a living. Um, there's a lot of science within um, the, your food laboratory as well as in cooking. We've already seen the Maillard reaction with the browning, um, but uh, Ms. Parsons' class wanted to know also, what is congealing when you're talking about uh, the cheese sauce? And you mentioned it might congeal if you took it off the heat. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a great question. So congealing um, is when that sauce will kind of just just harden up a little bit in there and it kind of uh, gets to like this, I'll call it like a gelatin almost texture in there. Um, we don't want that. We want it to be nice and smooth. Um, we want it to be able to kind of be pliable and warm. Uh, we don't want it to kind of stiffen up. Uh, maybe at home, if you've ever been cooking and you've kind of made something similar to this and you turn off the heat or you put it in the fridge and it kind of becomes like gelatin almost a kind of little bit bouncy in it. Um, that's congealing in there. Um, we don't want that to happen right now. Uh, we want it to be nice and warm and smooth for when we put it on top of our burgers here. So adding the liquid parts like the beef broth, did that help prevent that congealing? We know we just took a piece of American cheese and threw it on macaroni after heating up. After a couple minutes, it's going to be solid cheese again. So is that what's yeah. keeping it as a sauce? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That beef stock kind of helped that out. Um, keeping this warm is also helping that out. Uh, it's preventing it from kind of tightening up um, as it cools is when it tightens up um, like that. So we just want to make sure that we don't uh, let that cool too much because we don't we don't want it to right now. And especially if we were making this at home and we had extra cheese sauce, uh, we need to refrigerate that. That's totally fine. Um, but when we make a burgers again and we have that extra cheese sauce, we just need to warm it up uh, to make sure that it's back to that consistency that we want. And Mrs. Parsons class also wanted to know how you became a food scientist to how, what was your pathway to becoming food scientist and chef? Yeah, yeah no, that's a great question. Um, and if you asked me that question uh, 10 years ago or when I was in culinary school, um, I would not have said I wanted to be a food scientist at all. Um, I would have said I wanted to be working in a restaurant um, and as, as an executive chef. And I did that for a while and um, really liked the aspect of playing around with food, playing with my food, right? 
um, and just kind of experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't work, um, what flavor combinations work and just developing recipes like that. Um, I had a project in college that um, we had to develop 15 recipes over two weeks um, as a project and I hated it. I think I did one recipe a day and uh, just kind of slept off the work because I didn't like writing recipes. Not, but now that's a lot of what I do is write recipes. Um, and so it's funny how times have changed for me. Um, but what I love about this job is I can come in here I, with a task and I can make something happen. Um, it's all about research. It's all about trends. Um, and we can dive into trends a little bit here too. Um, we look at trends when we develop recipes. We see you know, what consumers want. Um, a lot of trends are just driven by what consumers want, consumers like you guys. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna push that burger out because it's popping up a little bit. Um, trends are driven by consumers. Uh, a trend right now that's on is North African. So we, this summer we developed a spice blend, Bear Beret. Um, it's not something that we developed ourselves, but we took it um, and put it with beef because it pairs so well. Um, and we filled that need so that way the consumer that's looking for this North African spice uh, can make something at home this summer uh, using that same spice blend. Uh, so we're seeing trends and we're seeing all of that. Uh, we're doing research, we're seeing gaps in where we can fill in, no matter if it's for beef, it's what's for dinner, if it's for King's Hawaiian or Gorilla's Pickles, we saw where there was gaps and then we fill those needs with um, something that works for us as well. Uh, so that's part of the process as well. And then it's coming in here with an idea and it's playing around in this kitchen. Um, and as you guys can see a little bit, um, there's some fun stuff in here. Um, there's tons of fun stuff over here on the side on one of my shelves. Um, that's fantastic just to play around with. Um, we'll buy different ingredients. We'll see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and then we, we test those recipes and we come up with something that works really great. And then we can write the recipe for it. And then when it comes down to writing that recipe, it's all about a format of what we have already. And I am actually going to, um, I'm gonna put a lid on these burgers. Um, they're a little bit thicker than I wanted and uh, you can see that there's still a little bit of red around them. Uh, we don't want that. So I'm gonna put a lid on these um, and I'm gonna ask uh, one of my guys back here to grab me a, a bowl, a metal bowl um, from just over there. And so I can get that going, but thanks Steven. Perfect. This is great. Um, this is a great technique. Just make sure you be careful with this. Uh, we're just going to put this bowl on here and that's going to kind of help those cook a little bit more. It's going to hold that heat in there. It's going to kind of create some convection uh, going on in there. Uh, a little chef tricks you might see. Um, so that way those burgers are going to cook up a little bit faster than we want. Um, we, we noticed so some metal We probably wouldn't yep. want to do that with plastic, right? You do not want to do this with plastic or glass. No, please do not do that. Um, just use it with a metal bowl um, and then make sure you have some tongs. And you can just kind of lift this up and see what's underneath um, as we go. Um, always have a good towel with you as well or oven mitt. Uh, so that way that works out. Um, but this is a great question. Um, and I hope that kind of answers that question. Um, I kind of got into this sector uh, by accident a little bit, uh, but I love it. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, it's great for anybody that loves just to cook. Uh, that doesn't always necessarily want that fast paced restaurant style and more so uh, thinking things out, uh, processes and things like that, thinking about flavors and ingredients and trends and all of that that goes into recipe development. Now, if I wanted to give a little steam to that burger, could I add some broth or water to that pan with the, and then put yes, the yeah. bowl over? Yep, if you wanna add a little bit of steam to this, that's totally fine. All you have to do is just take some water uh, don't use broth, but take some uh, a little bit of water and you can just put a little bit of water underneath there and that'll kind of create that steam as well. Uh, you can see a bunch of, maybe you can see, <laughs> there's a bunch of steam escaping out of here um, already. So we're already creating that kind of steam. As the water vapor from this hits the top of that bowl, it drips back down and that's what's creating some of that steam already. So it's basically putting water in on itself as it cooks. And now will that cause the burger to be juicier? uh they might not absorb much of anything in there um that would be something i would have to test but it would be inconclusive almost because we're not sure how much water is actually being absorbed by those burgers but there probably is not much but you are increasing the um heating time so you're correct to yeah, a yep. quicker. So we're increasing that by just covering that up uh if we're using a skillet putting a lid 
on the skillet is also a great way. Uh, that's how I kind of cook burgers at home is in a skillet. And then I just put the lid on top and that creates that same kind of convection in there with the heat and everything moving around. Um, so we noticed that you discussed and we saw a little red on your burger um, and you were a little concerned about that. You felt like they were too thick and you needed to yep. add the dome. So what, what would be your um, feedback for safe cooking temps? What are we looking for? Where are we yep. looking to get uh, to kill, kill off any harmful bacteria? Yeah, we're going to want to make sure that those uh, ground beef burgers, um, meatballs, meatloaf, all of that ground beef product, uh, we cook it to an internal temperature of 160 um, at least. So that way it's safe to eat for us. Uh, we don't want to do anything less than that. Uh, color is not an, always an indication of doneness either. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So make sure what, whenever you're cooking to use a probe thermometer, um, an instant read thermometer, you can just stick right in there. We can see what the temperature is and make sure it's safe to eat. Once that thermometer says 160, you know it's safe to eat, you can pull that off. Uh, so that's a great question. Um, if we're cooking things like uh, steaks or anything like that, uh, we need to let those rest. So we pull those off. We know we want to cook those to 145. We'll pull them off at 140, let them rest and come up to that 145 temperature. But doing the same thing, just using a probe thermometer and uh, making sure that uh, we get those up to a safe temperature. And we probably don't want to continually check the temperature. Is that correct? We want to try to get towards the end of the cooking process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would not stick my thermometer in there before I've even turned these for the first time. Uh, I wanna make sure that, you know, there's no pink on the outside of it or anything like that with, in this case, uh, before I stick that thermometer in there. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, you don't, you don't wanna be poking at it a bunch. Cause it could, cause it could cause the burger to fall apart as well as we're trying to keep that juice in, right? Correct, yep. It'll cause it to uh, leak out some of those juices, even though the, the, the poking of it, it is really small. Uh, nowadays, but it will cause some of those juices to come out um, and possibly fall apart. So we don't want that to happen. So as you're in the food laboratory, do you use a lot of science in your in your position? Yeah, yeah. There's always a lot of science. Uh, cooking is that science. Uh, there's so much science that goes on in here um, with just heating methods, with cooking methods. All of that um, is a science. Uh, important to pay attention, you know, in your science classes. Um, we talk about this, a lot of the same things that are applied to cooking, uh, heat and the transfer of heat, the convection of heat and all of that applies to cooking. And then we see things break, being broken down, um, all of those carbohydrates, amino acids, and all of that is being broken down. Uh, we're seeing um, that mylar effect, that reaction happening on the outside, that caramelization, um, another science right there um, happening on the outside. So we can see it. Uh, we can smell some of those things that are happening um, and it's all, yeah, just broken down into a science. So our students are being challenged to create a new cafeteria meal using beef. Um, and they're looking to create something unique, maybe not a burger, a steak or some kind of dish. What would you suggest to them? Their first step should be thinking about number one, what kind of dish I'm going to make? And number two, what kind of seasoning I'm going to yeah. use? Yep. Um, you're going to be doing the same thing that I do in here um, almost every day, and that's coming up with a recipe, right? Um, there's a lot of different places to start, um, but what I would do is I would come up with a cuisine, uh, something that's on trend. Uh, we can go back to that uh, North African that's super on trend right now, and maybe that's what you want to stick with. Well, now that you have that cuisine or that region of the, uh, of the world, uh, go and research food types, seasoning blends. Um, cooking methods, anything, um, vegetables, what's in season, what's not in season, what grows there, everything, um, and do all your research on that. And that's when you can kind of create things. You can create those flavor profiles and you can come up with your recipe that way. Uh, that's a great starting point and that's where I would recommend starting. Um, and then as you go, um, build your recipe with those flavors. Don't do too much but don't do too little. I know it's kind of hard for me to say that and uh, for you to understand it, but um, it's all about trial and error and experimenting, you know, um, coming in and testing. If you guys are, let's say one of you guys making a burger with that North African spice, um, tweaking the spice, you know, maybe you want it to be more of a warming spice versus more of like a herbal spice, um, an herb essence to it. Um, so tweaking those spices around and playing with those flavors and trying it multiple times before you come up with a final product is what's key uh, to developing those recipes. 
uh, we can all say, I can say a million times that I know exactly what garlic tastes like, but you know, you don't always know what it tastes like combined with other things. Uh, so just tweaking that and tasting and keep plugging away is what's most important. So it sounds um, like it's just not a science, but there's also an art. There is, yep. Um, so my burgers are pretty well cooked here. I don't have any peakness on them. That um, bowl on top helps us out quite a bit. Uh, so what we're going to do is actually I'm going to toast up my buns now. I'm just going to pop these on here. And move a couple of these burgers to the side. While you're doing that, I have a great question from CP Weberport, Washington. They want to know where you went to culinary school. What kind of yeah, what culinary uh, schools are out there? Yep, that's great. Um, I did my research. Um, as you guys know, I was from upstate New York. Um, I'm actually from Olean, New York, if anybody knows where that is, uh, just south of Buffalo. Um, but I did my research. Um, I found culinary schools in state and out of state. Uh, I found Johnson and Wales, actually. Uh, they have a Providence, Rhode Island campus. I went and visited the Rhode Island campus, uh, loved it. It was a huge campus. I wanted something a little bit more small because I'm such from such a small little town. I was going to pull these buns off while we talk. Um, and I saw that they had a Denver campus that was uh, fairly small and more um, unique. So I came out here to Denver, uh, went to Johnson & Wales uh, for a uh, two-year degree in culinary arts. Um, I had already had taken a tech class in high school for two years. So having about four years of culinary experience, plus uh, working in kitchens since I was pretty young, um, all accommodated to all of that. And then going to culinary school uh, and that experience was fantastic. And it was great that I went in there with prior knowledge into, into school. Um, that just helped me be more successful. So as it looks like we're finishing up those burgers and we're going to go back to that art side of culinary, uh, there's uh -huh. that's art and science of, of plating our food. We eat with our eyes. So what are the things that you think about when you plate a dish? Yeah, exactly. Um, like you said, we eat with our eyes. So a lot of color, making sure that not everything looks the same. We don't want just a bunch of brown on here, right? We have brown. Uh, from the burgers, we got brown from the slider buns. We don't want a lot of brown on there. Uh, so when we're thinking about developing recipes, um, it's always great to visualize and draw a picture of what you want that final plate to look like, right? So here's my final plate. So I would draw out a nice rectangle um, and then I would show my sliders on there and then I would show my toppings and I would color those in with colored pencil. Uh, so that way I can just visualize what that looks like. Um, I did a lot of those drawings in culinary school. And I still find myself this day, um, I have a, a notebook next to my bed and it's got colored pencils right there. Um, and I'm always constantly drawing something out. I'm not the best drawer in the world. I usually just draw stick figures. It looks terrible, but I can, using the colors um, really helps uh, me visualize uh, a final product like this. Um, so when we're doing this, we wanna make sure we have a lot of color. We wanna make sure that we're incorporating all those different colors because that's what appeals to our eye. We eat with our eyes. Um, so I kind of have that going already here, um, and I'll kind of build this and kind of talk about it at the same time uh, with those colors. I got my cheese sauce here, so I'm going to start with that on top of these burgers. Um, you might ask me why I'm starting with that cheese sauce. Normally, if we were making just any kind of a cheeseburger, uh, we always start with the cheese right on top of there. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to do this time as well. Um, this cheese sauce has kind of got that orangish hue to it. So already we're incorporating a nice bright orange color. I'm gonna probably put about a tablespoon onto each of these and top this off. So I already have my orange on here. That's already appealing, but if we just look at this just now, we can see it's still kind of bland looking, right? We just kind of got some browns and then we kind of got this uh, dark orange here a little bit. So now we want to add some, some bright colors to it. Um, we have those Gorillo's pickles that I was talking to you about. So now we're going to add those on top. Now we have nice green. Uh, we have a little bit of white coming in there as well from the pickle. And already see, look, those look fantastic. We already got some nice bright colors. It looks more appetizing, right? As we're looking at that, we're like, oh, I could probably eat that now. Well, let's keep building some of those colors. Uh, we're going to add a little bit of red onion. So now we got the purple coming from that. Red onion's a little bit pungent, but that's okay. 
Uh, we kind of need that to kind of pick up some of those flavors in this recipe. And then last but not least, we have a little bit more green, but a different kind of color of green. Uh, we have kind of this army green looking jalapenos. They're pickled jalapenos. Uh, the reason why we are putting jalapenos on this burger, uh, we kind of wanted to go with like a pub style um, kind of feel to it. Um, kind of when you go to a pub, you kind of get nachos and stuff like that. Um, so we're kind of getting that same experience here with that kind of nacho flavor a little bit. Um, plus jalapenos spice right now is that bold spice flavor is super on trend. So we're hitting another trend right now with putting those jalapenos on there. All right, so we got a lot of color on here. It looks fantastic. Uh, we could even add more, but we don't wanna necessarily overdo it. Um, if you guys are looking at this, this camera shot, actually it looks really good. And um, it's really catch, catching my eye seeing this um, cheese kind of uh, fall down here on the front. Um, when we're talking about food styling or plating or anything like that, having some of these kind of layers and being able to see the layers um, is key. It, it just looks fantastic. Um, and it's really eye catching, that's for sure. So we're gonna put our top buns on here now. Um, we have a little bit of black coming through. Um, you can kind of see on this middle one here, some of that black, that char from the, uh, uh, the grill, from grilling those buns. So it's just another color to add on top there. Um, and it really looks really nice finish out there with some of that, uh, that top salt from these buns. So we're, we're diving into some, some color theory here as well. It's thinking about how color plays with our mind and thoughts. We have complementary colors with the greens and the yellows. Um, so there's a lot of science in that as well. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of science that goes into that as well. Um, I had a chef in culinary school always tell me never, never have anything blue on your plate. Blue is not a natural color um, found in anything. Uh, we think about blue, blue, blue candy, but that's not natural, right? Uh, there's no fruits or vegetables that are just blue. Um, we think about, you know, like red grapes, but they're purple and things like that. Uh, they don't necessarily have those same hues. Uh, blueberries are actually more purple in the purple family than they are in the blue family. Um, but we don't want to play with any um, unnecessary colors, any fake colors. Uh, we don't want any of that. We want this, the food to speak for itself. And we want that natural color to come through. And could you cut into one of those sliders so we could see the inside to see that? Yeah, sure. How juicy yeah. those burgers are. Yeah. And, and as you're looking. doing that, what, what's your favorite beef dish? What do you love to cook? What do you love to eat? Um, my favorite beef dish. That's a, that's a, actually a great question. Um, if we're talking about a steak, my favorite steak cut is definitely a ribeye steak. Um, love ribeyes, love the, the nice, uh, contrast of fat to beef ratio in there to lean muscle. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, love just kind of getting those seared in a cast iron pan, uh, served with some sides. It's always fantastic. Love a nice ribeye steak. Uh, if we're talking about maybe more of like a, uh, a roast cut. I definitely love tri-tip. Uh, that's something that you guys don't really have out there in New York um, is tri-tip. Uh, you can always go to your butcher. Uh, they will most likely have a tri-tip on hand. They're fantastic. They're kind of like a roast, um, but they cook kind of like a steak. Uh, they're just so good. They're a lean cut of beef. Uh, they're fantastic. They're great uh, grilled. Uh, you can sous vide them, throw them in your air fryer. Uh, you can also just cook them. You can smoke them. Uh, they're fantastic. They're great multi-purpose cut. So I definitely love a tri-tip. Uh, let me go grab a knife uh, and I'll cut into one of these. So as Chef um, Alex is cutting into those burgers, we're going to get a chance to see what he's able to uh, create from just raw um, ground chuck, um, as well as these cheese sauces. So we look forward to having your uh, submissions here in the next few months. Please feel free to reach out. If you have any other questions for Chef Alex, um, reach out to us and we relay those questions to him. Um, hopefully you all are inspired to go and hit your own food laboratory in your schools. I know that looks delicious and it was 30 degrees out this morning, but I think I'm gonna have to go out and get the grill started. So there we go. There's their inside of our burger. Uh, looks fantastic. We got a good color on there. Uh, made sure that it, uh, we cooked all the way through and we are cooked all the way through on there. Uh, fantastic, you can see all the layers coming through again and that's what's key. We wanna make sure that we have a good bite of all of that uh, in our burger. So we did an excellent job here today. Hope you guys, I know you guys aren't cooking along today. 
uh, but you guys will be cooking along in the future here for this recipe. So I hope you guys uh, had fun. Hope you had a successful um, burger cooking. Um, when you guys are developing your recipes or anything like that, if you guys have questions on beef cuts, where they come from, if they're lean or not, uh, and just kind of cooking methods in general, and this would be great for your research, is always go to beefitswhatsfordinner.com. Um, we've done all of that research for you. Uh, you can come on to this main page here. There's recipes, get some inspiration. I always look at um, photos and images on Google all the time for inspiration when I'm developing recipes. Uh, you can come on here and find some inspiration. Uh, you can also click on the cuts and we have every cut in there, how to cook it uh, and where it comes from and all of that. So it's a great resource when you're developing these recipes. Uh, so make sure you head over to beefitswestfordinner.com. This recipe on here today is in one of those collections. Uh, so you can make this anytime. There was a few others in this same collection that we developed. Uh, I think there was two more uh, burgers just like this uh, for King's Wine and Gorilla's Pickles. So um, you can also make those if you want to make all three of them um, and test them all out. Well, Chef Alex, we want to say thank you uh, for your time with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, tuning in with us early in the morning, all the way out in Denver, Colorado. Beautiful uh, kitchen behind you. One exciting job. You did a great job with our, our teachers and students. They're all saying thank you. Um, and I think we have some uh, inspired participants. So thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing those dishes coming in. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you.